Hello all you glorious hoodlums out there in Chessland. Welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. Here, take a drink. I'm picking my ear again. I gotta get a haircut and get a shave, you know. You won't recognize me for summer. <laughs> Let's do a Bobby Fischer game. This is a really good one. He's playing Popovich. King's Indian Attack, 1956, so he's still young, but let's watch what Fisher does in this game. Very interesting. Knight F3, Knight F6, and Black resigned. <laughs> All right, I'm exaggerating a little bit. G3, G6. Here we go. We are having fun yet. Bishop G2, Bishop G7, perfect symmetry, supersymmetry in physics. Yeah, we're seeing it in chess. See, that shows that chess and physics are accurate, right? Yeah, whatever. No, look, you think I'm kidding? More supersymmetry. I've got a book. I've got a book in here. The science book on supersymmetry. Symmetry, supersymmetry. Where is it? Oh, I hate it when I can't find my science stuff. Oh, well. That's the end of my reality. There we go. We can go home now. But hold it. I've got a game to show you first. Fisher puts up D3. D6. Now, come on! <laughs> I can't remember where I read this, but if you do play uh, symmetrically in the opening like this, be very careful if you're black, because I've heard it's an advantage for white. I'm just saying, I'm just letting you know, right? So be careful how far you take the symmetry, okay? Knight B to D2, and now E5. Symmetry is broken very nicely with a bam, big thrust right down into the gut. The center, the center where everything radiates. I mean, that's like a Christmas present, isn't it? All right, I'm excited to be on this Bobby Fischer uh, game again. <laughs> again, somewhat symmetrical, yes. But this symmetry is fighting the center, and Bobby has an extra support here that Popovich does not have an argument against there. And that means this square and this square is stronger for Fisher at this point. Well, not that square. This square is, though. So, so this is already getting interesting. And now Popovich goes 98. And in the King's Indian attack, this is a typical uh, maneuver of the, of the knight. Yeah. So it's all good so far. C3. Fisher is cautiously preparing for his d4 push on the pawn. Uh, we'll see this in several of his games. It was a theme of his. Um, it's probably a theme in the opening as far as that goes. I have not studied this opening as strongly as I ought to. I did a bunch of videos on the Rui Lopez, and now every blasted one of you want to play me the Rui Lopez online. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's a great opening, you guys. I'm not kidding. Fun stuff. I've never had more fun than I have with online chess, man. F5. Okay, now, uh, now it's getting serious. He's bumping up for space. Yeah. Fisher's doing the same thing. Neither one of them are cramping each other. They are meeting right in the center. So this is going to be a dynamic game, and then there's that push. That's what Bobby was looking for, the D4 push to gain better control of the center and the squares. F4. Kind of interesting. Cramping? It's not permanent, of course. But, hitting Fisher's kingside cover. And uh, so this is going to be interesting, isn't it? We'll, uh, we'll look at this. Now, it's not necessarily a wing attack, but center go, or Fisher goes right to the center. Yeah. D takes E5. That is so Fisher. Yeah. Now the D file is open. 
and we can begin operations. Yeah? And knight to c4. This is another uh, maneuver in the King's Indian attack for white. The knight really does find a good square on c4. Pretty much a lot. What do we see with this maneuver? The e5 is being hit. Okay, I'm just pointing things out. Not necessarily that the whole game is going to revolve around e5. It, it's obvious this is what we're looking at, right? Uh-oh, queens opposing each other. Yeah, that's, that's almost a given. I mean, that is so blatantly obvious. You can't miss that, you know. That's like catching Santa Claus on Christmas morning because he got his butt stuck in the chimney, you know. But, but this, a little more subtle, a little more interesting. And the tension here on the king side. Already this game is taking on some interesting characteristics. That, that's all I wanted to show you. And Popovich certainly says, let's swap the queens. And Fisher has no choice. Whether he's comfortable with it or not at this young of an age, doesn't matter. He is playing without the queens today. So, knight c6. And g takes f4. So Fisher wanted to be the one to exchange. He didn't want both. Uh, apparently, he wanted to exchange that pawn. And e took the f4. So we've got a pawn sticking in the, uh, in the king side just a little bit here. Uh, backed up by the rook because he castled already. Oh, hey. E takes F4. E takes F4. Hold on. One of you is talking to me. Let's see which one of you guys are interrupting me while I'm making my very important video. Dark side of war! How dare you interrupt my video! Hold on. He's playing me. I got to do this real quick. What the heck? A queen pawn opening, dude? Really? Come on, dark side! Queen pawn boring! Oh, no, I'm kidding. Well, wait a minute. You know what? <laughs> Take that. I'll keep the move secret until we finish the game. Who else is bugging me? Ooh, D. Cago. Ooh, and he made a good move. Good job, dude. We're toward the end of our game here. D. Cago is playing me, and he's beating my bottom really good. What'd you take, man? Oh, you dirty rat, you got a piece up on me. Oh, that just sucks. No, I mean, that sucks. Okay, I'll take you with my rook, pal. Okay, now, you guys quit interrupting me while I'm doing my video. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake, really? Oh, look at this. Dark side, you're becoming a nuisance! What? You think that's going to scare me, dude? Come on! You can do better than that! Oh, hey, he's got a message for me. Looking forward to a casual, gentlemanly, take-back kind of game. Ha! I'm going to checkmate you and I'm giving you nothing, pal! Now oh, we have so much fun in the chat while we're playing games. Hang on, i got to tell him yes. Yep. Twill be fun, amigo. Yep. Oh, man. He's saying more. He says, I looked at a couple of videos online about this opening. I don't know the theory that deep, but I look forward to seeing how it works out. Yeah, right. You probably read three books on it, dude. Don't give me that noise. All right, now quit bugging me, man. I got videos to make. Okay, I love playing you guys online. I'm not kidding. So there you go. There's your shout out right in the middle of my obfuscation of Bobby Fisher. Now, what was I lying about before I got interrupted? Okay, Bobby goes knight to d4. And this is another typical knight maneuver. No joke. This is cool. Uh, and now knight takes d4. Now, watch how this plays out. What? Okay, now, um, this is instructional. This is good. Uh, I have learned, unfortunately, through bad experience and some comments from some much higher rated chess players than I am, that in some of my games I was developing a habit of when, when there was an open file, 
and I was being taken here, I used to respond by taking it with the rook, and that takes a serious... Uh, I, I need to get another thousand games under my belt before I begin swapping with the rook. Putting the rook out there uh, is iffy. For instance, c5, and that would certainly help black here. So Bobby took it with the pawn. That's the correct way to exchange. I'm just saying. Now look what this does. Yeah, the rook would have given him the open file. Don't worry about that. Bobby, Bobby has this under control. The two pawns in the center with the backup of the rook and the knight out here and then the bishop hitting this pawn here, that's a much better position. Yeah? Okay, I'm, I just want to point that out. That's really important. And thank you to those of you who have told me to quit, take, quit retaking in an exchange with the rook so much. What it does is it causes you to lose the initiative. For instance, if he would have taken it with the rook, then he gets a pawn up and he's hitting the important uh, d4 square and he's got support on that d4 square with this bishop here. Yeah, the bishop there. That's why you don't take it with the rook. Duh, you dork. <laughs> See, you got to look at all the pieces. I just, I just so hate that habit of mine where I get tunnel vision. I swear to goodness, I'm going to overcome that habit and then I'm going to become unbeatable. Not for a few years, but I swear to goodness, I am so sick of getting clobbered that way. And I have way too much of it going for me. F3, coming down. Now Fisher bumps the bishop. Okay, I'm going to interrupt this game for just a brief moment. I just want you to understand, I did find my supersymmetry book and beyond. This is by Gordon Kane. He's a really great author. He's the Victor Weisskopf, Distinguished University Professor of Physics at the University of Michigan. So, big stuff. Good subject. If you like physics, read this book. It's a 2013 book. If you don't like physics, read this book anyway. It's good to use your brain, right? So anyway, okay. Now, after the commercial break, we return to our regularly scheduled game. Okay. So... He's pushed the f3, hitting Fisher's bishop. He's not going to retake, of course, because the rook is back in this file. Notice that Fisher's pawn is support, or Fisher's rook is supporting his pawn, and so is Popovich's. So this is pretty good. Bishop will bump down to f1 here, and we have knight f6. And Fisher, what's he do? Knight e5, centralized knight on an outpost in the middle. Fantastic. That's great stuff. Yeah, that, that is great stuff. And then bishop to e6. Hold on, I think my camera just came unplugged. Hold on, i got to put the power in. Man, I'm interrupting this game like crazy. This is horrible, just horrible. You're not going to get anything out of this game if I'm not careful. There we go. Is that better? <laughs> Oh, yeah, baby. Now, where was where was I before I was so like... Oh, sorry, it's typical backyard professor boorish, silly ha-ha, and all that crap, but this is an important lesson, so will you please get serious? <laughs> Carrie, <laughs> that'd be me. Ah, take a bow, take a... All right, here, let, come on, let's do this. Oh, we're trying to study chess, you moron. So Fisher does put 95 on a great outpost pointing toward that uh, king side. There's no question what's in Fisher's mind, right? Well, I mean, there's lots of questions, but... And then the bishop came to e6. And d5. Now notice, Fisher is hitting the target. He's closing down the bishop from its, from its influence. And notice the subtlety here. The pawns are moving forward, central pawns that move forward unopposed. That can be dangerous. If you're playing Fisher, it was fatal. Let's keep watching. This really gets interesting quick. The knight comes to g4, so he's going to attempt to swap the knights. 
here because he's too strong in the center. He does have a good couple of targets, but he can't take them, of course. The king covers, so that's not going to happen at this point. There's not enough pieces. Both of them are rather undeveloped still, but they're, they're uh, maneuvering in the center here. And Fisher does not want to trade off knight yet, so he bumps back. D3, remaining centralized, but bumps back, and then the bishop will go to C8. Okay, so things are good at this point. Fisher gathers more steam, developing all of his pieces. F4 hitting the target. Yeah. Rook takes the F4. So Popovich is going to go down the exchange to get rid of that bishop. He loses the exchange here. Let's see how this affects his game. Now the bishop will come to e5. Again, look at the manipulation for the center influence. This is critical in every game. And again, Fisher will bump back down, hitting the target, central power. And now Popovich takes the bishop h2, kablam. Now, if you're in this position, uh, you're, you're sweating bullets. You're going, oh my gosh, it is a real kingside attack, and it looks vicious. Fisher just basically, oh, you know, how well, another day in the office. Even as a 12-year-old, he had an office when he was age 12, right? It was his mom's kitchen. <laughs> I don't know where he's hung out, but it was at home and in the chess clubs, right? King h1, not a big deal, in other words. It's what I'm trying to tell you if you would pay attention. And then bishop d6. Keeping that critical diagonal toward the bishop. Keeping the pressure on. See, that king is completely loose. Yeah. Now, notice, what if Popovich would have developed his rook and bishop sooner? Yeah. Uh, the implications here are staggering when you really ponder this idea of develop all your pieces as fast as you can. Man, if Popovich had his other bishop and his other rook in this game, yeah, look at, just be aware of things like that in your own games. Uh, really, sincerely true. Are you serious? Someone else is interrupting me again? See, that's the problem with being the backyard professor. Everybody wants to play me. Look, it's a challenge. Are you serious? Who's challenging me? Who are you? Ooh, it's Mo. Oh, and he wants to do a casual standard game with no time limit. Okay, I'll accept. Mo, congratulations! We're going to play another game, pal. All right, let's start with the king pawn real quick, and now I've got to do a video. I've got to finish this video, dude. But at least you got a little fame. I mentioned your name. <laughs> okay, we'll see how that works. Okay, man, you guys. It's relentless. But I'll tell you what, I love playing all these games because it's great practice, yeah. Okay, now where was I before I started becoming so rudely interrupted so badly all the time in this game? Holy shenanigans, baby! Where was I? Seriously. Bishop d6. Come on, don't let me. Okay, bishop. Okay. Bishop h3, target. Target. Right. And, well, I mean, he's pinning the knight to the bishop if he wants to exchange bishops. Uh, otherwise, uh, Popovich will lose his knight. I don't know if he wants to lose his knight. His knight's in a good position here, right? And neither did he. So he came back. 95 central. 95. But now the bishops are staring down each other. What's going to happen? Interestingly, Fisher took the central knight that has more influence than worrying about that bishop on its home square. So keep that in mind when we do exchanges in our games. For Fisher, it was more important to get rid of such a powerful centralized piece than it was worrying about that bishop. And really, that bishop's not real good. The knight was incredible because of its position. Do you see that? That's important to see. Hence, it makes sense why Fisher chose taking the knight instead of the bishop.
right? Okay, I just want to point that out because that's really important to see the uh, the way Fisher uh, learned how to exchange and where on the board to exchange. That becomes yet another factor of the many thousands we have to keep in mind in every game of chess we're playing, which is why it takes us a lifetime to master, right? Well, some of us. <laughs> now Fisher has a great bishop outpost. Bishop e6 check. Nice. And now if the bishop exchanges, he's got a deadly pass pawn. Do you see how that interlaces here? Rather than worrying about taking the bishop automatically, bam, and bringing his rook out because he'll exchange, so that would have helped Popovich, wouldn't it? It would have got his rook activated. Rather than do that, it's better to take the central knight, swap the knights, and then put your own bishop on an outpost and get a pass pawn. That is great chess. Yeah? Not bad, right? Okay, fun to point out. Yes, it's taken me a few minutes to point it out, but this is the idea of studying the Grandmaster games, and especially Bobby Fischer's, because he was so good at it, you know? I mean, you know, he, he was just, he, ah, ah, it's illegal how good he was. Rook d3 target. That d3 pawn, if your opponent has a pawn like that, and I had, I had a game or two or three like this, that's not comfortable. And if you can, man, get rid of that pawn. That, that, is, that is not good. So the rook lift makes sense, doesn't it? You say, okay, I get it. I'm not lost. In this particular situation, you wouldn't be lost as to, well, now what do I do? Right? I mean, yeah, that's grabbing another partial open file and hitting the target, however, and it is fully developing. That's good. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. Fisher probably will in this game, but at this point, look, his king is really open. And so we have to take care of business. That makes sense. Okay, okay, enough elaborating already. Come on, man! So rook d3, and now bishop takes e7. Bishop takes e7? What? <laughs> I can't even read my own handwriting. Bishop takes e6. How can a 6 look like a 7? Come on! Really? Dude, that's embarrassing. Oh, boy. D takes e6. Boy, there for a minute I thought I was in trouble. And behold, the birth of a pass pawn. And not just a twink. This guy's buffed. He is ready to romp. Man, so, wow. This changes everything. And look how the advancing toward the pawn occurs. Yeah, immediate attention. This is one of those situations where you can't ignore, you must react to it. You must get over there and kill that pawn, or at least blockade it. Yeah, good illustration of this. Past pawns are dangerous, and now, yeah, I mean, come on, you figured Bobby had put everything into it, right? So should we. So, rook a d1, double the file. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. And watch Rook E8. Now everybody's developed everything, right? However, Fisher is up the exchange because of Popovich's earlier choice to go down the exchange. Now we'll see. His plan did not come to fruition. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going down the exchange if you can actually win the game and you've got the game, but Popovich didn't. So you got to watch that, right? So this is really getting interesting. And uh, Rook takes F3 check. Get rid of the pawn and go check target. Nice. Very nice. King takes E6, yeah. Yeah, the pawn falls. Uh, Fisher suspected it would, probably. 
That's not that big of a deal. And now centralize your king or at least start bringing it toward the center because we're in the end time. Notice who has a majority, though. Pawn majority for Popovich. This could get interesting for an end game. Keep our eyes peeled. And that's why Fisher immediately just shut her down. Done. No more bother. That pawn move makes sense, right? Right now, done. Don't sweat it. Yeah, that's how he did it. And now he came b6. Um, yeah, he came b6. I'm not going to elaborate on that. Rook to d2, covering his sixth or seventh rank. Uh, h5, here comes Popovich. He's going to start pushing pawns like crazy because we are in the end game now, believe it or not. It, it's good enough to be an end game. Rook f to d3, double the file again, and rook comes to f8, grab the open file. Rook goes to f3, argue for the file. A common theme, I'm telling you. So, uh, bishop f4, no, he doesn't want to swap rooks. No, he really doesn't want to be without a rook, so that bishop move makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, he's down the exchange, so he he uh, has the handicap. Fisher can put more pressure. Fisher can take more of an initiative than Popovich can at this point. So this is critical for Popovich and then Rook C2 target, of course, and C5 uh, get rid of the target. So Rook B3 target. Observe this. Yeah, I don't target consciousness, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Bishop C7, got to protect it. Notice who's reacting to who. Right? Rook D2, open file. Rook F4, target. Rook G3, Target with a check and another target. Of course, then you got to take care of that bishop first. Rook. Come on, Popovich, where are you? Rook f6. Block the target. Yeah, that. notice who's reacting to who. That's important, you guys. This is really good to see work. Rook f3. Look who's threatening. Bishop f4. We've, we've seen this before. <clears throat> yeah. Rook to d8. Ooh, going to sneak behind the lines. Again, we observe the power of the two rooks as opposed to a rook and a bishop. Yeah, in the end game. And boy, have I been in Popovich's position with some of you guys. <laughs> no fun, I'm telling you. King e5, central king. That's what you want to do for sure. And then what? Oh, wait, wait. King e5, wait. Rook f to d3. And then rook f7. You went to rook f7. Man. And then he went to rook h8. I hope I got this right. And then the king came to e5. Man, I skipped a line. Sorry. Oh, I hate it when I do that. Hopefully this is the right position or I'm going to be mad as a pig in spit. Or uh, spitting mad. And one of you again are interrupting me. I don't know who you guys think you are thinking you can just interrupt me all the time. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I promise. Ooh. I've never heard of this guy before. Hey, a new buddy. All right, yes, I'll accept your game. Hello, I'll talk to you later. I'm busy. Can't you see that? <laughs> I guess he can't, can he? Oh, man, I hope I got this right, you guys. Doggone it, I'm going to be mad if I don't. F3, given the support to the central pawn, fundamentally so. Uh, keeping your position solid in the center. Again, I'm going to emphasize that. Critical. Uh, so this is good. Uh, H4, here it comes. And notice who's behind the pawn. Now, 
Fisher's strategy of coming up and over and behind. You want to try, if at all possible, to be behind the pawn, not in front of it. If you're in front of it, it puts you on defense. If you can get around behind it, you're on offense. Kind of a cool little thing. Don't know if you knew that or not. You do now. Uh, rook H6 Target Rook F6 Protecting Look who's reacting to who I'm just going to keep mentioning that for a few times uh, Watch this Really? He didn't take him with the bishop? Oh, crap, I hope I haven't messed this. No, it says bishop f4. Oh, that's hard to believe. I can't believe Popovich didn't take the rook. I don't know what's going on with that. Popovich did not take that rook. No, I've got it right. Rook f7, rook f8, king e5. Yeah, I've got that right. Holy cow, Popovich had a chance to take the rook. I don't believe it. I hope this works. Now, here's the other crazy thing. King e5. Rook h6. Rook f6. Rook takes f6. Where did g6 come from? Oh, I'm sorry. Holy crap, you guys. I, sw I promise I will start writing this better. He put the pawn to g5. No wonder the... B yeah, jeez Louise. Shall I just start over? Good grief. That doesn't ruin the game, I promise. But let's see. Let me double check here real quick. Uh, g5. 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 What? Yeah, g5. Oh, and then rook fd3. Oh, my heck. Okay, okay. So now that that makes sense, Rook F Rook Rook came to H6, and then Popovich came to F6 to challenge the Rook. Now it makes sense, and Fisher took the Rook, and the King took Fisher's Rook. Yeah, he forced the exchange on him. Is what he did. Wow! I finally got it right. Yes, I got something right in this stupid video. Uh, guess what, though? Here he comes, rook d7. And king e5, centralize the king, uh, and rook b7. Yeah, now you've got targets. Now you've got targets. And king comes to uh, d4, or, or d4, I mean, sorry. d4, and rook takes b6, taking targets. So the, uh, the pawn majority... He still has it. It's an isolated pawn now, so Fisher's got the two pawns together. So this is looking bad for Popovich. Uh, and C, C pawn scurries, and now rook b5. Yeah, two targets, although that one's guarded. So you know he's bumping for this one, and then he's got the pass pawn. He'll run it in if Popovich isn't careful. Bishop to c7. Yeah, he's got to guard the pawn. Look who's responding to who. I'm just saying, rook d5, check. King comes to e3, and now rook takes g5. Blam. Yeah, and it is here that Popovich resigned, because the rook just overwhelms the bishop. And part of the reason why, I mean, it's the logic of chess, it's the internal logic of chess, is because the bishop is stuck on one color throughout the game, and the rook is not. And that is one thing that makes the rook stronger in an end game than a bishop. So, really fun game, cool game, a, uh, a tremendous win for Bobby. This was kind of the springboard into his really powerful chess, which is coming up. Once I get through the year 1956, we've got a few more uh, games of Fisher in 1956. Once we get through that, 1957 really starts picking it up, and and he this is when he started. He's been recognized, and from 1957 on is when he really started to play a lot more chess. And we're very fortunate because we have a lot more games to look at. So, 
So there's your Fisher game. Sorry for all the interruptions. I'm sorry you guys are so rude that you keep interrupting me by continually challenging me to chess. And I love it, man. Don't stop. Now, if I decline, don't take offense, right? There's sometimes I just can't accept a game. Most of the times I can at this point in time. Um, if you'll do a standard rated correspondence of three-day moves, I can pretty much accept all of those. Uh, rated or casual, I don't care. I, I, I'm loving playing the game. I don't mind doing rated with you guys who are less good than I am so that my rating can bump up. For you guys that are so much better than me, I'll never beat you. Go casual. <laughs> all right, that's it. That's enough goofing off. You guys are awesome. I mean that. You guys are awesome. I, I salute every one of you, my online friends and my chess club friends. I love all you guys. I'm not kidding, man. This group is fantastic. So anyway, have a good evening or a good morning, depending on where you are in the day and or on the earth. And I will see you guys in the next Backyard Professor Chess video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for putting up with my shenanigans. I, I feel bad about this. I really do. I try hard to be totally serious all the time, as you know by now. And so, you know, we'll carry on. Get it? Carry on. Carry. Shut up and shut it off already, dude. See ya.